The exodus that followed the partition of India and Pakistan in 1947 led to one of the largest human migrations in the world and resulted in the mass abandonment of private property and structures of cultural heritage. Hindu and Sikh temples and havelis in Pakistan scrambled to find an audience following the partition that was driven along religious lines. Today, Rabia Arif, an urban and disaster risk management specialist at the World Bank, takes us through the walled city of Lahore, where these spaces of heritage are being inhabited by low-income and marginalized communities as informal settlements, leading to what I call accidental preservation. In our conversation today, Rabia rethinks the idea of conservation in South Asia, where such informalities within heritage structures often take center stage in urban planning, but are not quite included in dialogues of conservation. I am Vaishnavi Shukla and this is Architecture of Center a podcast where we highlight unconventional design perspectives, practices and research projects that reflect emerging discourses within the design discipline and beyond. Architecture of Center features conversations with radical designers, thinkers and change makers who are redefining the way we live and interact with the built environment. I hope you've brushed up all your graduate school thesis memory. Otherwise we'll have to jog your memory now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit and I was like I was like wow, <laughs> taken aback <laughs> by what I had um written and like there were a lot of there were a lot of great ideas, probably very poorly written <laughs> and uh, very long and complicated, but um like I almost feel like rewriting the whole thing and expanding on some of those ideas, but but there were definitely a lot of very interesting ideas, so that was Nice. I I read a part of it but not the whole and I was like, wow, I need to sit down and reread what I wrote in 2019. <laughs> oh, that happens to me with even the stuff I have written yesterday. So don't worry. 2019 is a is a long time ago. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. So let's jog your memory a little more and start off by walking us through the old wall city of Lahore maybe. Absolutely. Um so I think uh like I'll start also like sort of describing what I was doing in the Wall City of Lahore. And uh basically my thesis was uh sort of trying to like study the ways in which the in- there is this informal inhabitation of spaces of heritage within the Wall City that actually subverted the original intent of the buildings. However, they helped in the social economic development of the spaces that were being inhabited and so with this sort of mission i think i started um just walking through the wall city like talking to conservationists talking to historians talking to older people just talking to the local people anybody that i could speak to and just learning a lot about uh everything that is there and then coming across many many like surprises and discoveries that actually haven't been documented and aren't as well known but it was really interesting in the city itself as is like most um historic cities is a palimpsest essentially um and it has like layers and layers of you know heritage from um the rajput to the ghaznavid to the mughal to the sikh to the colonial and current times and so it's it's really fascinating and so like i you know i was going through this and i just saw some really really um interesting ways in which heritage was being sort of inhabited and reused and there were spaces that were like there was this really great and very beautiful sikh haveli called uh, haveli nona hal singh which is now repurposed as a government girls school and so like it was just a fascinating building which is beautiful and it has all these like it has a room which has which is filled with frescoes but at the same time you have all these like really young girls playing in the courtyard of this uh haveli and then you have all kinds of interesting more informal processes going on where there's these havelis that are repurposed as like elastic making factories or like bookshops or like shoe making 
uh, informal businesses mm. that are growing within like some of the uh, rooms. And then you have some really crazy things, which is like um, there was a uh, mandir, like a temple, a Hindu temple, which is a vermicelli factory. And then mm. um, I also came across a lot of um, Hindu temples that were actually used still by like very low income uh, populations that whose uh, sort of ancestors were the migrants or the refugees from the partition. And they were just using these temples as their homes and were dwelling within these structures. And so it's like really mm. um, interesting and uh, very layered, <laughs> you know, instances. So your thesis and I think a large part of your professional practice in Pakistan, which is a few years ago, focused on this area in Lahore, the one that you're talking about. And you were particularly looking at addressing questions of heritage. And by heritage, I think it extends into a slightly different discourse on documentation, preservation, adaptive reuse, and the likes. And you found that conservation, particularly in South Asia, differs vastly from the European context. One of the ways in which I think it differs is that it's not exclusive in the way it's preserved. I mean, it's not almost a conscious decision, but it's, how do you put it? It's accidental preservation, for the lack of a better word. I don't think a term like that exists, but it seems like it's been preserved because of these uses which very organically happen within those buildings. What do you think? Do you want to talk a little bit about your fieldwork and your other observations? Yes, absolutely. So this was uh, my interpretation of what is happening, that I was trying to rethink conservation in the South Asian context, and particularly in Lahore, which is a city that I was studying in Pakistan. And so, like, you know, I was asking the question of what exactly is conservation? And not only what is conservation, but who has the right to conserve? How can spaces of heritage be used in my home? And can such instances, as I described before, that are, you know, sort of conservation or preservation done just by inheriting uh, inhabiting the structures, can this be the conservation of heritage? And so it was, it was, a, it's a, the thesis itself was like very comprehensively, like, uh, you know, like addressing a lot of different and researching a lot of different uh, issues from the idea of what conservation means, um, not only the Western context, but also in the applied uh, South Asian context, but how even within the Western context, like it, it is, uh, you know, something like the Venice Charter is coming from a very sort of linear notion of what history is. However, even within the Western uh, philosophy of history itself, this is contested like the Hegelian notion of linear history is contested by Walter Benjamin, who has a more sort of historic materialism, a more like fragmented mm. approach. And so I was thinking that, okay, if this is what's happening in the Western context, what is happening in the South Asian context, where the notion of like time and history as well, as consequence to the notion of what time is, is far more, it could be cyclical at times, there could be, um, mm -hmm. you know, like a idea of the rise and fall of civilizations and like it's it's very different. And so uh, with this idea and also like, you know, realizing how the world itself has moved on with the idea of what conservation is, uh, especially thanks to the Nara Charter. I think you must be aware of like Japanese temples that question you know, the notion of what authenticity is and what it means to, what preservation means essentially and what is it that you're preserving, that uh, it also led me to allow for the rethinking of what it would mean in the South Asian context, especially where there are these, you know, sort of vibrant, inform uh, informal living environments within these spaces mm. of heritage. Yeah, whatever you said was so tantalizing and kind of made me nostalgic about time at the GSD about three, four years ago, talking about Walter Benjamin and Hegel and the other guys out there. But uh, in fact, one of the words that you 
mentioned palimpsest is also something that we've spoken about a bunch of times in this season and i was reading something you wrote and found this one except very provocative you said quote in the south asian context preservation practices typically lead to the sanitization of the vibrant often informal living environments within such spaces of heritage thereby instigating a disengagement with the present and the removal of traces of those alternate histories and quote and yes this is a direct reference i think to benjamin but to begin with i really appreciate your use of the word alternate histories as opposed to a singular history with you know the capital h but more than that what struck me was your inclusion of informality of these heritage spaces within the conservation dialogue now informality and by extension you could think about and we often think about it as encroachment most times raises the question of patronage of the resident with regards to the upkeeping of the building and earlier in the season we also had somebody from India who is talking about patronage as almost a predominant form and almost a requirement for preservation how do you look at preservation without an accountable patronage so i think there's uh, so many responses that i want to give to uh, your question and and one one thing that immediately struck me was like your use of the word encroachment because i actually do address this in my thesis where i'm sort of like highlighting how like right now especially uh, especially in the wall city of lahore this was this is like one of the tasks of the government um uh, the government faction responsible for uh preserving the wall city which is like removal of encroachments and so and actually i worked with them <laughs> when i was um you know in mits my undergrad uh, as an intern and i was also a part of uh that activity and this like all of what i'm saying is actually arising from my work later as well uh as a historic preservationist in lahore with the akhan trust for culture and so um in terms of encroachment you know i was like researching about the idea like sort of the notion the beginning concept of like conservation as a discipline within um south asia and also like who's you know installing it who's beginning it it's very much colonial right it's very much coming mm. out from the archaeological survey of in uh, uh of the ASI the uh sort of the british colonial officers that are coming and responsible for like you know preserving these structures and um like it's very interesting to see sort of their uh notion uh what it means um you know to uh conserve and so basically like for example someone like h h cole um who's uh you know comes up with the first sort of document for like preservation uh report of these structures and he's sort of speaking very much about um his theory of conservation is very like restoration removal of encroachments and he's saying that these places should be kept solely as show places and as the only means of perpetuating some of the most beautiful and interesting specimens of lahore and pure mughal art and so his you know his whole idea is that this is our buildings for show right and mm. uh he outcries the occupation of um uh, a sarai of near the jangir's tomb by railway employees and their families and he says it's an evil which has caused and is still causing unceasing and cruel destru- uh, destruction and then you have a lot of the um what's it called uh you know a lot of these uh characters that are just speaking about how um the natives don't really have any idea how to conserve their own instruct uh you know uh structures and so they're speaking about how uh there should of what conservation means and so they kind of install you know a concept of it which still in many ways uh is being practiced um you know by the current uh preservation pract- uh, practices in lahore and so um my my question then you know arose in that context that in a in a place especially thinking about a place uh, especially countries that are also low income and the wall city of lahore is a place where a lot of the population is demographically lower 
income. Uh, a lot of them, there's also migrants and refugees. You know, they're people from uh, minority ethnicities. And so mm. what does conservation mean in such a space? That was one of them. And then uh, the question, one of the ideas, one of the main ideas of the thesis was an attempt to conceptualize the historic urban landscape together with the spatial temporal landscape and depict the ways in which the users and inhabitants of the built environment engage with and add layers to it over time. And so by that, alternate histories is not just the past histories, but it's also the present histories and also the question of the conservation thinking about future histories. No, I, I think it makes sense. But my question still is, uh, you were working with the city of Lahore and you were looking at the encroachments, quote unquote, the encroachments. And I wanted to maybe just push you a little bit more and think through that idea of encroachments in terms of how, well, I would want to say universally, but as, at least in the South Asian context, we live in. Uh, with those informal settlements and the dense urban fabrics that we have. But when it comes to tourism in a lot of places with a certain heritage importance, there is that need to sanitize the places, sometimes to the extent where they're not recognizable anymore. But at a higher level, we are also looking at public policy and the economics of maintaining a demarcated heritage area within a city. And it often has to do with tourism. I don't know what tourism within the old wall city of Lahore looks like, but I'm just drawing from my Indian context and how there's a fair bit of tourist activity within these areas. I mean, they're also living cities. They're not completely abandoned and just tourist places. But in the European context, what has happened is we've We've seen city centers being almost unaffordable for middle class people to live in. And so you have all these luxury stores popping up and boutique hotels and bed and breakfast. But we know that it does not necessarily hold true in South Asia. I mean, we still do have the boutique stores and luxury brands showing up in heritage precincts, but what is what is your reading of that interweaving relationship between heritage and tourism in in Lahore? Is it I don't know if the wall city of Lahore does look at its dense urban fabric as a place where tourism could bloom? No, Vishri, absolutely it does, and that was one of my critiques of it, which was that what exactly. Why is there like one static notion of what tourist, tourism itself should be? That why is it that a, you know, heritage building, uh, it need only be sort of a museum or sort of a musealized place of history where often museums in our context are not as uh, approachable or accessible by uh, lower income residents. And and no, I'm not, not at all against museums. I feel like uh, in my thesis as well, I sort of like differentiate between like very very grand you know spaces of unesco world heritage site and then those spaces that are sort of considered lesser heritage and not taken care of or not having the finances to be taken care of but the question really was that even in terms of tourism would you rather you know like come and see for example the nonahal sikh haveli in all its glory as an empty building mm. or would you witness it as a girls school and how does that detract from what it is, uh, but except to only like maybe add to the experience. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, uh, that's that was the essence that once you do do this sort of more high end commodification, you do sort of take out the soul of the city. And so the question is that you can still, you know, like focus on uh, economic development by focusing on local economic development, focusing on maybe informal businesses and, um, you know, the people, the residents there and uh, have this combined approach of doing preservation, you know, like somehow do uh, keep the buildings, but keep, uh, you know, repurpose them for the inhabitants, for their businesses, for their living and create sort of this symbiotic harmony between preservation and urban development. 
and also ask, can conservation essentially also help the poor? And I'm saying this, and um, I also remember that I came across this um, Guardian article about Walter Benjamin, while I was really interested in it, about uh, about dirty, sexy cities. That was the part of the title. And um, he's basically, you know, complaining about how European cities were essentially just that. Like he was saying that Marseille and Moscow, you know, are so like, vibrant and wild and there's dirt but there's also like there's a lot going on and then slowly you see now that they've also been sanitized so probably south asia is in a place where europe was once in its past but the question is that do we really want to follow that you know mode of development or do we want to keep or retain something that that is very that we know now as south asian which is like this vibrancy and this life and and also like it's not just i think this is also becoming into um uh, the idea of like local creative uh, and cultural industries and their economic development is now also becoming more mainstream where you have like even the world bank sort of coming up with a culture and creative cities report recently and trying to really make the case for economic development for these local businesses so you know it's 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 a i think it's becoming more understood as a way to go about things you did your research almost two three years ago i don't know what the governance structure in lahore is like and i'm kind of really sad that i was i was meant to be in pakistan earlier this year but that trip never happened and i really wanted to see lahore but what do you think the city stands right now with regards to its vision for urban development um with conservation with tourism is there any sort of a master plan that the city has or i don't know like a heritage cell or any any specific governmental body that is looking at the overall state of buildings and urban fabric and not just buildings as structures but buildings with all these alternate lives that is you know being occupied by either a vermicelli factory or a shoe making factory or a girls school yeah so uh, i think i have a uh, slightly been out of touch <laughs> with what's happening in lahore very currently as now i'm mostly working on uh, places like lebanon iraq Africa places in Africa. And so um you know but but my na- my last uh, sort of update on the places that and especially like I do uh you know coming out of the thesis I did study like you know all the organizational mm. structure and there's there's actually a lot of different factions public and private. And so um for the wall city itself there's a government faction that works on its preservation. Additionally there is like the evacuee trust property that focuses on um the heritage that was uh you know left over from the partition and it's often like sikh and hindu heritage and then mm. there's the okaf which focuses on religious monuments so like they have taken care of all the uh the mosques and then uh at the same time you have the you know this international organization like the ahran development network that has their own uh you know the ahran cultural services pakistan which is also one of their major projects is right now in lahore mm. so they have uh i think a year or two years ago come up with a master plan for the wall city in uh nice in you know together with the wall city uh authority and which is very much funded by uh the french development bank and so um so it's interesting because there there are a lot of these uh external donors but um there there is like a whole plan for uh how to go about it uh so there's definitely that there's definitely still um you know this uh, a proper plan but also i noticed that the ahad also has like a development approach which does think about uh you know the sort of the communities that are living there and sort of does work a lot on reuse as well so um so you do have all these different elements mm now you mentioned uh before i did that you've been working in lebanon and other international contexts so yeah after this wonderful thesis and after graduating from mit 
update us on what you've been doing and what your current work looks like and what is next for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so after I um, after MIT, I joined the World Bank, <laughs> exclamation mark. And so um, I think that I, especially I think it was this, maybe this experiences within the Wall City, which, you know, made me look at conservation in a different way and made me also realize that there probably isn't really any conservation firm that's working specifically in this way that I could, you know, join. And so I think I went more towards urban development. And so the World Bank was a place for that. And I was also, uh, in MIT, I was also much more, uh, I became very engaged with sort of urban informality and was working with like, you know, reintegrating the informal city of Buenos Aires into the formal city. And so at the bank now, I've been, um, you know, involved in a lot of similar aspects. So I'm a urban and disaster risk management uh, specialist here. And so I work in, uh, for example, in, in very different diverse projects, to be honest. Like, I think uh, the experience is that you just get on, like, you know, very different projects all of a sudden. You just get them thrown at you and you just take it, sort of. And they're, and they're all interesting. So I also don't, can't, don't say no. And so um, I'm working on things like, um, so in Lebanon, we're working on the post-conflict reconstruction of housing and heritage. Mm. Uh, after the Beirut explosion and in Iraq as well uh, after you know the whole situation with ISIS Um, and so that's been very interesting and I think Lebanon specifically like Beirut one of like one of the things that we've been trying to do right now is uh, try to also preserve some uh, historical housing that Mm -hmm. can also become uh, like re uh, re-inhabited by the lower income uh, groups that had left it. And so also sort of become, you know, like social and affordable housing. So I think that kind of ties in very well with yeah. what I wanted to do and what I hope for. And so like, I hope that that comes into implementation right now. We have uh, next week, actually the project uh, appraisal and the, the final meeting to like decide uh, whether this project, you know, how this project will go through and be, begin. Um, and so uh, that's like one part of it. I've also been working on like urban poverty and informality, um, also on like very different things such as like mainstreaming climate resilience and in, uh, infrastructure PPPs in Ethiopia or things like that. And so, um, mm. so it's been a lot of diverse things, but it's, uh, it's been very interesting and um, a steep, a learning curve and I think currently I think I'm still just learning more and like getting into more of this um, work with and the realization of how uh, you know negotiations with the government how to uh, go about these projects how implementation actually could happen in these contexts learning from the implementation on the ground that I saw with the local government in uh, Pakistan so it's it's uh, it's definitely very interesting and uh, there's a lot to it (laughs) right now (laughs) i think if there's anything you can sum up from your career trajectory and you know your wonderful change in direction is that architecture training can be modified in multiple ways and i think you pretty much embody the mission of the podcast that is to highlight all the different ways in which we could engage with the built environment beyond just architecture. So yeah, thank you for being on the show and for wrapping up the season. This was a long journey, but I think it was so sweet and delightful at the end. No, absolutely. Thank you so much, Vishnavi, and so proud of you for doing all of this. And, uh, you know, good luck to you as well for all your future endeavors and honored to be a, a part of your podcast. Special thanks to Ayushi Thakur for the design and research support and Kahan Shah for the background score. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Arc of Center. And we would also love to hear from you. So drop in a high at our website, arcofcenter.com. That is A-R-C-H-O-F-F-C-E-N-T-R-E. And thanks for listening.